Well, we are not quite finished with verse 1. We have noted the elect lady. We have noted the elder, John the Apostle, and the characteristics of John. Uh, we have uh, noted the uh, uh, lady and her children. Now, the lady uh, representing a church and the children, the people who are part of the church. Now, looking at 2 John 1c, as I call it, the New International says, Whom I love in the truth. This is the present active participle from the Greek verb agapao, A-G-A-P-A-O, and that is the word for unconditional love. And the present tense is a linear action start, and it should be translated, keeping who I keep on loving. The active voice, the subject produces the action of the verb as it is in all of the, in, of, in unconditional love. That is uh, the person doing the loving, who in this case is John. John says, I keep on loving from the source of my own character or the filling of the Spirit produced in my character, whom I keep on loving. The participle is a circumstantial participle. And so uh, we move on then to the word truth. Truth is the Greek word aletheia. A-L-E, this is an eta, T-H-E-I-A, aletheia, which is the word for absolute truth and uh, it is uh, a very important word because it is the word for Bible doctrine. Uh, absolute truth is the word of God. The, not only does the Apostle John love those who are in the church there, but he adds, but also all who know the truth. This is a perfect active participle from Gnosko, the word know. Uh, G-I-N-O-S-K-O, both of these are omegas, G-I-N-O-S-K-O, Gnosko. And the, the, uh, the perfect tense tells us that it is something in the past with uh, uh, results that are permanent. And so we are talking about those knowing the truth in the past with the result that they have a permanent knowledge of the truth. These are obviously believers who have uh, studied the truth and who have stuck with it and who have had the uh, spiritual advance to the place of spiritual maturity. Uh, but uh, he is saying everyone uh, who knows the truth uh, uh, also uh, love you. Now oh, we've got a few doctrines now that we've got to go into uh, and we're going to take them uh, as we come to them of course. The first that I want to deal with is the doctrine of the importance of truth or the importance of doctrine. Then I'm going to go into the doctrine of love, which is a rather extensive doctrine, and though I have taught it in the past, I have uh, been reworking it now, and I'm ready to uh, reteach it. Uh, then when we get to verse 3, we've got three great doctrines. We have grace, mercy, and peace. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of categorical doctrines coming up. That's why I think it's especially important for us to study the doctrine of the importance of Bible doctrine. I don't know uh, uh, if I've heard them all, but I have a, a guess that I've heard a good portion of the excuses for the failure to study Bible doctrine. And many people will say, well, doctrine is so dry and uninteresting. Of course, that's not true, but that's what they think because uh, they have in their minds the preset notion that doctrine is, uh, is, is that way. And uh, someone else will say, and this I've actually heard from people who have been in my Bible classes, I lost interest by the time the pastor gets to point 22 in the doctrine. Well, it is possible for uh, a pastor teacher to become involved in the academic communication of a doctrine. And it's also possible for uh, a pastor teacher to uh, fail to uh, simplify and uh, amplify what is what he's talking about. Uh, I, as I uh, will say and have said uh, consistently, I am absolutely and completely grateful to Colonel R. B. Theme Jr. from Baraka Church, who not only teaches from the original languages, uh, uh, puts the words on the overhead projector for the entire congregation to see, he is also taught systematically or categorically. That is, he takes the entire doctrine and uh, puts it uh, into categorical form. And uh, uh, this is very important. However, having said that, I appreciate it, 
And having been on doctrinal tapes from Colonel Theme for many, many, many years, I can say that many of the things that he uh, teaches become so confused and so technical that uh, they it actually obscures uh, the doctrine that is being taught. Uh, I'm sure, however, to his congregation who have sat under him and who have been initiated to all those things, it, it is probably very, very clear. But to someone coming from the outside, uh, the discussion of hope one, hope two, hope three uh, is very difficult. X plus Y plus Z uh, and some of the terminology which he uses. Now there are many terms which are extremely clear and very, very helpful. Helpful, But I have, and I got fell into the very same trap when I was at, uh, in Fort Wayne. Uh, the congregation was growing and they were sticking with me and there weren't a whole lot of new folks coming in and as a result I, I found myself uh, uh, getting more and more technical for quote unquote their sakes and it was it was easier because that's what they wanted and to to satisfy what they wanted I, I went along with that and uh, I was wrong and since moving here to Florida I have determined uh, to make things more and more clear I sometimes slip back for example I have changed in all of the current doctrines the word rebound referring to first John 1 9 to confession of sin now, I have uh, a, a large number of Colonel Themes uh, categorical doctrines uh, in my computer, and I find that they are, some of them are just absolutely so uh, technical and so involved and so lengthy that they do not uh, amplify, they do not clarify, and they just cannot be used. Uh, that's uh, uh, a, a tragedy because they are fantastic uh, the doctrines and have fantastic insights into the Word of God. And so uh, it, it is uh, wiser, I think, and uh, in, in as far as my ministry is concerned, to uh, uh, try to uh, shorten the doctrines, yet still cover them, uh, and to be uh, extremely clear in the communication. So sometimes it takes small points, a point, uh, uh, sub point A, B, C, and so forth, to do it. But um, I do understand that people can lose interest uh, over a period of time, if you go uh, into uh, like point forty five or ninety two of a certain doctrine, nevertheless, having said that, let me also say that uh, if it is the doctrine of the Word of God, it is worthwhile concentrating on regardless of how many points there are because and some doctrines, the doctrine of love is longer than other doctrines. The doctrine of the importance of doctrine, as you'll see when you get the notes, uh, uh, is not going to take uh, that long because there are only ten pages, or nine and a half uh, of pages of, of uh, notes. But, and it'll only take us probably two classes to get through that. The doctrine of love will obviously be longer. But I've heard that excuse many, many times. Then there's the excuse, I want something that's relevant to where I live right here and now. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Bible doctrine is as relevant as you'll find anything in your life. Because, you see, everything else in life is unreality. Only doctrine is absolute truth. And since it's absolute truth, it is reality. It tells you what is, what is actually happening, what is real truth. Everything else is relative. Everything else is uh, uh, determined by a person's perception, and his perception is determined by his experience, by his frame of reference, by uh, his culture, by so many other things, so that he doesn't really know what reality is unless Bible doctrine teaches him what reality is. And there is nothing more relevant to life than to understand what reality is. So don't ever f uh, fall for that excuse, I want something that's relevant. I want something where the rubber meets the road. Uh, even, even the Apostle Paul, in, in, all, in the, many of the epistles, for example, the book of Galatians, which we are uh, currently studying in our Tuesday night class, the first uh, four chapters are uh, doctrinal chapters on law versus grace. Beginning in chapter 5, he has two chapters a very, very practical application. But you can't apply what you don't know. And therefore, he teaches very carefully in chapters 1 through 4, law versus grace. And when he comes to the end of chapter 4, he has knocked out every prop 
that uh, legalism is based on, now he can st go with chapter 5 and say, stand fast in the freedom with which you have been freed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is very, very important to understand that you cannot, you cannot have application of doctrine that you don't know. You've got to know doctrine first. And then there are those people, the pseudo-spiritual type, or spiritual. Oh, we just love doctrine. We want you to tell us what it says, but don't bother telling us what the Hebrew and Greek say. And certainly don't give us those point one, point two, and on and on and on. Well, I remember I heard that at Moody. Never tell them uh, what, the, what the original language uh, is. Tell them that the original language says this, but never tell them what the original language is. And uh, that's, that's rather ridiculous uh, because uh, as I go back and remember Moody Bible Institute, that's what they told us in homiletics class. However, uh, the, uh, the greatest Greek professor, Dr. Kenneth Wiest, who also taught Bible classes. I mean, I remember taking uh, Romans under his ministry. Uh, but uh, uh, I love Dr. Weiss so much. I used to bring him out to uh, church functions to speak. And uh, uh, we had, a, I remember bringing him to do a, a youth retreat that we had uh, where we brought 100 teenagers together for the weekend. And Dr. Weiss came out. And you know what? He taught that group of teenagers just about the same way he taught those of us at Moody Bible Institute, uh, although on a simpler level of language. And uh, uh, they were enraptured. They sat with, uh, with total attention and complete concentration. They were thrilled at what he had to say. And uh, it amazed me because in Hamalaya's class they said, don't do that, and he was doing it. And therefore, uh, it, it, it proved that uh, these idiots were absolutely wrong. We throw homiletics out and uh, don't even give it a second thought. Now, don't confuse hermene hermeneutics with homiletics. Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. Very important. Homiletics is how to preach, quote-unquote, and dispense with it. The Bible is to be taught word by word, verse by verse, category upon category, consistently. But... Uh, the, these are some, uh, just some representative attitudes of many believers in many churches today. Now, I'm going to make a very dogmatic, emphatic statement, and I, I, I don't care what anybody says. Till my dying day, I will believe this, and I, uh, unless God tells me differently when I get to heaven, uh, I will always believe it. No believer ever reaches spiritual maturity apart from the teaching of Bible doctrine in both an exegetical and systematical form. It's absolutely necessary. The exegesis, of course, is the science of taking the verses apart, and uh, the categories is to build one, one uh, verse upon another to build a systematic theology. And it's only systematic theology that produces mature uh, believers, believers who know the whole teaching of the Bible on a given subject. And that is very, very important. Uh, now, this is not topical teaching or topical preaching. Uh, there, were, uh, there are a lot of preachers who do that today. But there are a decreasing number of pastors who teach from the original languages. Now, why do I put the original languages up on the board for those who are here or even for those who are listening by tape? Why do I put them on the board? For one purpose. Even if you do not understand the Greek or the Hebrew, I want you to understand that I'm not just picking something out of the air and saying this is what it means. I am showing you why what I am telling you is what that verse actually means. And you can see from the use of the tenses, from the use of the moods, from the, mo the use of the cases and so forth, these technical things, you can see why the translation of the expanded, I call it the expanded doctrinal translation, why the expanded doctrinal translation that I give you is, uh, as far as I am able to discern, the very best translation. Now, um, whether or not you have studied the original languages, you can appreciate where, where I'm coming from. But uh, 
the question is why do so many people shy up men who are behind the sacred desk today why do they shy away from it well for one thing they have uh, that many of them don't know it uh, I know that some people uh, and I talked to some f kids some years ago graduated from the pastor's course at Fort Wayne Bible College when it was Fort Wayne Bible College who were able to graduate without taking either Greek or Hebrew in the pastor's course ridiculous absolutely and totally ludicrous but it is possible to graduate uh, uh, from school having taken Greek uh, you don't have to take Hebrew but even if you take in Greek or Hebrew but never ever use it again but I think uh, more so there's an increasing use of the number of pastors who seek the big idea from the paragraph uh, of course uh, the writers of scripture wrote in paragraph form and the New International Version generally puts the paragraphs uh, uh, clearly marked so you can see them uh, uh, unlike the, the although in many of the old King James versions they did mark the beginnings of paragraph with the paragraph marking that's used in editing but uh, to today uh, they look at the paragraph and uh, gather resources uh, from here there and everywhere to fit into an outline uh, that uh, usually has three major points and they s sound alike either starting with the same letter or ending with with uh, uh, shun or or uh, whatever uh, the point is uh, that um, uh, the they are not teaching word by word and verse by verse and if every word of God is God breathed and it is then every word in the original language of scripture is important and that it behooves the man who dares, who has the audacity to stand behind a sacred desk, to know exactly what the original language has said. Uh, I just this week received some information from a Chafer Theological Seminary out in uh, Huntington Beach, California, where uh, George Meisinger, a good friend uh, and uh, uh, ice pastor, uh, has, in addition to uh, his own church uh, uh, he is uh, the dean of this seminary and they're, they're growing but the whole purpose of the seminary and it's, it, it's absolutely different than any other seminary in the, in the whole country because it's all it, it does is to seek to produce pastors who are capable of studying the word of God and, and uh, for that uh, they recommend four to five years of in-depth study of the Greek plus four years of Hebrew uh, they can overlap but uh, that total amount of study and uh, so you, <laughs> you can see that this is not something that is is uh, something that's optional now if a pastor is in the the uh, uh, pastorate and has a responsibility and doesn't know the original languages that doesn't excuse that pastor from teaching word by word and verse by verse he just has to find out what it actually says from someone who does know and then he can go from there. There are other pastors who uh, give what I like to call a running commentary on the passage of Scripture, uh, very much like uh, some of these one-volume commentaries. Uh, if that's proper, why well, just issue a commentary to each member of the congregation and do away with paying someone to be the pastor. Uh, while I was at Moody, there was at least one such pastor who was also on the faculty. And uh, he even... Uh, uh, had a very large church in, in the suburban Fort Wayne area, Chicago area. And uh, um, we would get as much from studying Fitzwater's systematic theology, which is what he used as his basis, uh, or any one volume commentary, than we got out of, of his uh, classes. He's with the Lord now, and I'm sure the Lord has straightened him out on that matter. Still others today are taking a text of scripture and then they go everywhere preaching the gospel. That text becomes just a jumping off place to share the information on their chosen subject uh, which they have called from all sorts of teaching and ex experiences. And uh, uh, all they, uh, they, they, they start with the needs as they see it of the congregation. And none of us knows the needs of the congregation. Only omniscience knows the needs of the congregation. And it is God's plan and program to prepare the members of the congregation before the need arises. And so the pastor communicates the word of God 
thus preparing them for something that's going to happen in their lives. Finally, and we have an increasing amount of counseling from the pulpit. They may use Bill Gothard material, Dr. Dobson's books, uh, which is not to criticize uh, uh, either of these men, or uh, the material produced from the Minrith Meyer Clinic, but they're doing nothing more than being a counselor to a group uh, called the congregation. Uh, in this type of teaching, the concept of self-esteem usually comes to the surface and dominates the teaching. But it's psychological, and the psychology uh, has no place in the ministry of the Word of God, except as the Word of God broaches anything that is psychological, and it, doesn't, it isn't called that. It's called the Word of God. Of course, I won't even mention the current health and wealth gospel, the tongues movement, the healing ministries. That is not communication. It's exploitation of emotions. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, in his final letter before his martyrdom by Nero, the emperor of Rome, exhorts young Pastor Timothy in verse 14 and following. He says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have believed, knowing from whom you did learn it, and that since you were a baby on your mother's breast, you have known the Holy Scriptures, the ones being able to make one wise with respect to salvation through Christ Jesus. For all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He goes on to say, I give you this charge. Proclaim the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. That's whether the opportunity seems ripe or not. Reprove, admonish, and encourage with great patience and doctrine. And the reason this uh, was to be done comes in chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who will say to them what they want to hear, having itching ears. They will turn their ears away from the truth, doctrine, and turn aside to myths, to stories, or to human viewpoint. And beloved, there could be no better advice for today. Teaching of Bible doctrine, the study of Bible doctrine, does not and will never put you in the majority. But it is going to put you in with what the Lord considers very, very important. All right. The importance of Bible doctrine, beginning with point A, which is the definition. What is Bible doctrine? Well, Bible doctrine, beloved, is the content of the completed canon of Scripture as found in the 66 books of the Old and the New Testaments as it is communicated by teaching and instruction. The content is discerned from careful exegesis. Now, what is exegesis? Exegesis is a critical examination of the text plus analysis from the original languages. Examination in the light of the historical setting, which we call isagogics, and then classification of subjects, teachings, and principles, which we call doctrines. Now that's a very complex but very important definition. The content of the completed canon of Scripture is discerned not by a superficial reading, not by what your translation says, but first of all by a careful, critical examination of the text, text and analysis of the original languages, examination in the light of the historical setting, and then classification of subjects, teachings, and principles. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, Bible doctrine is called the thinking or the mind of Jesus Christ. And listen, if, if God is thinking this and God has revealed what he is thinking, nothing could be more important than knowing what God is thinking, understanding how God operates, 
and understanding all these things through his integrity. And doctrine is vitally important because it is related to the attributes of God. Uh, and it becomes, therefore, the basis of all true worship. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 138, verse 2. I myself will worship toward your holy temple and praise your person for your grace and a doctrine. For you have magnified your doctrine above your person. Wow! Now, very only idiots will take the name or the person of God in vain. Uh, and many people do that, and they are idiots. But if God has made a statement that I have magnified doctrine above my person, and the King James says your name, but uh, uh, the name speaks of the total person, then what can be more important than studying what he has magnified above his person? You know, all kinds of people will go around and say, praise the Lord for this, praise the Lord for that, especially some of the charismatics. But what this passage is saying, what this man is saying is, is that thinking doctrine is the way to praise the Lord. It is the way to worship the Lord. And the only way you can worship or apply the doctrine is to put doctrine first in your life. And we're going to look at a, at a passage which shows the importance of, to our Lord Jesus Christ of doctrine, but if you will take and compare Luke 23, 46, which is uh, some of the, were the Lord's last words on the cross, with the passage of Scripture that he was quoting. See, he was quoting a passage of Scripture uh, while he was on the cross. Uh, and uh, uh, he was quoting Psalm 31, 5. Uh, and from Psalm 31, 5, we learn what the Lord Jesus was saying, even though it was not recorded in Luke. For in Luke 23, 46 says, Into your hands I deposit my spirit. But what does Psalm 31, 5 say? In its totality, it says, into your hands I deposit my spirit, for you have delivered me, O Yahweh, God of doctrine. Think of it. On the cross of Calvary, as he completes his ministry, his very last words were the quotation of Scripture in which he, God the Father is called the God of of doctrine. I'm going to tell you, you cannot, you cannot exalt doctrine any more than that. Romans 3, verses 3 and 4. Shall their unbelief, that is these, the uh, heathen, shall, uh, and these, the, uh, the religious people, and all those who are described in 1 to 3 in uh, Romans, shall their unbelief cancel the faithfulness of God? Definitely not. Let God continue to be faithful, even though every man is a liar. Even as it stands written in Psalm 51.4, that you might be vindicated by your doctrine, and that you might prevail when you are maligned. You can malign truth, Bible doctrine, but you can never, never destroy doctrine. God only deals with us in truth, and truth is doctrine. And God always tells us the truth, and so doctrine will always tell us the truth. But you can malign the truth, how? In two ways. One, by distorting it. That's, that's false teaching. And secondly, by ignorance of it. More Christians dis, uh, malign doctrine by ignorance of doctrine than anything else. While grace is the genius plan of God to bless us, and integrity is the character of God, Bible doctrine is the manifestation and the explanation of that fantastic genius. Bible doctrine is the permanent expression in written form 
of God's integrity expressed to the human race. It is the verbalization of divine justice. Doctrine is the study of the attributes of God. Psalm 33 verse 4, For the word of the Lord is integrity, and all his provision is in faithfulness. Bible doctrine is the thinking of God in terms of relationship to the human race. Therefore, we had best pay attention to it. Now, there are a number of words which are used in the Old and the New Testaments which are words for Bible doctrine. Let me just delineate a few of them and go quickly through them and give you a few passages of Scripture that are related to some that you can stop the tape and look up if, if you'd like to share what these have to say, all right? First of all, from the Hebrew. The first is the word emeth, uh, which is the aleph, uh, M-T-H, in its uh, root form. And it means truth versus false. The true versus false doctrine. You can read it in Proverbs 22:21, Psalm 31, 5, 25, 5, 26, 3, 86, 11, and the 119th Psalm deals in every single verse with the Word of God. But especially look up Psalm 119, verse 142. The second word which is uh, used is the word kakma, uh, which is C H A K M. A H Kakma, and it refers to Bible doctrine in the human spirit which has been cycled into the soul where it becomes the principle, the value system, and is, is exhaled as wisdom. You find it in Psalm 8.1. Then we have Shemua, S-H-E-M-U-A-H, Shemua, which uh, means that which is heard or concentrated on. It is information, it is teaching, it is doctrine. Isaiah 28.9. Lekach, L-E-Q-A-C-H, refers to the self-discipline necessary for the person to learn doctrine. Uh, learning, or what one hears, what one receives in learning. And uh, we, you can look this verse up in Deuteronomy 32.2, Proverbs 4.2, uh, Proverbs, uh, or Job 11, 4, Isaiah 29, 24, and Jeremiah 11, 4. Or maybe, I'm not sure if it's Jeremiah or Job. Look them up anyway and see which one refers to it. Then, then uh, finally in the Hebrew, Musar, M-U-S-A-R, means what is learned by doctrine or instruction. It refers to learning Bible doctrine as the principles by which you live your life. You can find it in Job 10.8, Proverbs 1.2, Proverbs 4.13, and Proverbs 23.23. 23. In the Greek we have a number of words. The first is ginosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O, and uh, uh, this means to learn or to know. It means uh, objective understanding in the soul, and we looked this up uh, more completely when we studied the, uh, the uh, principle of the grace method of perception, and if you don't have that, uh, look, at, look it up in that doctrine or ask for the doctrine. Uh, the advance on that, epinosis, uh, simply add the prefix epi to gnosis, and uh, it means uh, doctrine in the human spirit. It's a, it te literally it's a full knowledge, but it refers to the knowledge which uh, not only has been learned as, as gnosis, uh, or gnosko, which is the verb form, uh, but it has been believed and transferred to the human spirit by means of perceptive faith. Then we have a couple of uh, other uh, uh, compounds of gnosis and, or gnosko. Prognosis or prognosko, it means doctrine in the mind of God, which has was exhaled in eternity past, for we have pro meaning before, uh, or the foreknowledge of 1 Peter 1 2, which refers to God's omniscience. God knew 
uh, prognosco, prognosis in eternity past. And that's what he revealed to uh, men who were born along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, logos, L-O-G-O-S, means speech, word, thinking, and sometimes refers to doctrine, in, like in Hebrews 6, 1, or 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Uh, didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, uh, means what is taught. Uh, it is uh, uh, sometimes um, uh, seen as didaskalia, which is teaching. Uh, it is uh, uh, Matthew 7:28, Matthew 22:33, Mark 1:22 and 27, Mark 4:2, First Corinthians 4:14:6, 4, Second Timothy 4:2, Hebrews 6:2, Revelation 2:14, Romans 6:17 and 1617 this then is followed by uh, F Nostos G-N-O-S-T-O-S -O means capable of being known uh, as potential intelligible Romans 119 uh, Suniasis or Sunidasis means doctrine in the conscience becoming the norms and standards of life and nostes, and G-N-O-T-E-S, refers to an expert in doctrine, someone who knows what, he's, uh, what, what the doctrine says. Uh, Acts 26.3. Now, sub-point C in the doctrine, the believer's legacy in Old Testament times was Bible doctrine. We've already noted Psalm 138, verse 2, so we shan't uh, I'll go into it again. We've noted that worship is the intake of Bible doctrine and the believer's response to that doctrine exhaled toward God. God's reputation with you is based on your understanding of doctrine. I mean, I don't understand how anybody could study the doctrine of grace and not be overwhelmed, as the songwriter said, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Uh, I don't understand how anyone who can, can study uh, the, uh, the doctrine of the hypostatic union, who would not be totally and completely emotionally moved to respond to God. Uh, when you think of, of what our Lord Jesus Christ did to add humanity to his always existing deity, the step down from heaven to earth, I mean, it just evokes fantastic emotional response and a worship which causes you to practically fall on your face before God. But uh, you know something? Almost every categorical doctrine that you know, uh, uh, that you study, okay, when it's concluded, causes you to stop for a moment and say, Wow, <laughs> I can hardly believe that it's true. You should know some of the ecstatic experiences, practically, <laughs> that I have as I work on these doctrines. And, uh, and a point is just okay, emphasized in my soul. Uh, I just uh, I just stop and uh, I don't I don't shout I don't speak in tongues I don't roll on the floor, uh, but I am overwhelmed with fascination and worship and praise and adoration for who God is and what He has done. Uh, and it all comes as as categorically we understand the whole Scripture on a given subject. You see, in any one verse you're going to get some information about a categorical doctrine. But you're not going to get what the whole Bible teaches on it. That's why it is so necessary to understand doctrines categorically. And I, that's why I do not apologize for teaching the, pardon me, the doctrine of, of John the Elder, or the, the doctrine of, of the church, uh, the doctrine of uh, election, the doctrine of uh, the importance of doctrine, the doctrine of love, the doctrine of grace, the doctrine of mercy, the doctrine of peace, all within a couple of verses of Second John. Because it's those things that are so important to you as a believer. Now, uh, would you like to know what doctrine has to say when doctrine speaks? There is a place in Scripture where the wisest man who ever lived as he was born along by God the Holy Spirit, gives us a monologue from Bible doctrine. 
That's found in the 8th chapter of the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to take the time to read it. It's so important. But remember, this, he starts out, does not doctrine call it. Now, he, he uses the word wisdom. In the Hebrew, that's kakma. I've already given it to you. C-H-A-K-M-A-H. And this refers to the Word of God Bible doctrine. All right? Does not kakma, doctrine, call out? does not understanding of doctrine raise her voice on the heights along the way where people go where the paths meet intersection doctrine takes her stand beside the gates leading into the city which is where the courts met at the entrances doctrine cries aloud and now from here on is a quotation this is what doctrine says for you O men I call out I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are naive and untaught, gain sensibleness. You who are thick-headed, dull, stubborn, and with a closed mind, gain insight. Listen, and you will become wise. Listen, for I have noble, valid, and right things to say. I doctrine open my lips to speak what is true and what is upright. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. Not one of them is twisted or confusing. To the discerning of the word that I speak, all of them are straightforward and honest. The words of doctrine, me, doctrine, are upright to those who have knowledge. Choose instruction from me doctrine instead of silver and choose knowledge rather than choice gold for doctrine is more precious than rubies and nothing you desire can compare with her I doctrine dwell together with sensibleness I possess knowledge and discretion discernment to have reverential awe for Yahweh is to reject evil. And I, doctrine, reject pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and confusing speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight and courage. By me, doctrine, kings reign, and rulers make laws that are just. By me, doctrine, princes govern, and all nobles who rule on earth. I, doctrine, love those who love me, and those who seek me, find me. With me, doctrine, are riches and honor, surpassing wealth, plus godly living. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I, doctrine, continuously walk in the way of righteousness, along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasuries full. Yahweh brought me forth as the first of his works. Before his deeds of old, I, doctrine, was installed in place from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. When there were no oceans, I, doctrine, was given birth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I, doctrine, was given birth. Before he made the earth, or its fields, or any of the dust of the world. I, doctrine, was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command, and, he, when, he, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I, doctrine, was the craftsman at his side, I, doctrine, was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. Now then, my sons, 
listen to me doctrine happy are those who keep my ways listen to my instruction and be wise do not ignore it happy is the man who listens to me watching daily at my doors waiting at my doorway for whoever finds me doctrine finds life and receives approval from Yahweh but whoever fails to find me harms himself and all who hate me love death wow what a what a declaration of the importance of Bible doctrine from the Old Testament as doctrine testifies to itself remember beloved that God is glorified when he can give us blessing in eternity past God determined a specific blessing pardon me which he has prepared for us even in eternity past and he has deposited those with our Lord Jesus Christ to be distributed to us when we finally reach spiritual maturity there's only one way that we can achieve spiritual maturity and that is when we have maximum Bible doctrine in the soul so that this has produced for us a capacity to appreciate the source of those blessings God cannot give blessing that will be misused and therefore until we have capacity for it and capacity comes only from continuously taking in taking in taking doctrine when we have that then God the Son can release those blessings in time and you will receive further blessing in eternity if Bible doctrine preceded the human race as we have seen if, if it was if it was there before he created the heavens and the earth let's understand this that both Bible doctrine and evil were here before you came now doctrine preceded evil but uh, uh, evil and doctrine were together before you came and doctrine and evil will be here long after you're gone mark this as a truism you cannot change either Bible doctrine or evil all the crusades all the marches all the uh, efforts all the money spent will never change evil but mark this down though you cannot change either Bible doctrine or evil both Bible doctrine and evil can change you and you are either going to be changed by the evil cosmic world system in which you live and all that it exudes or you are going to be changed by Bible doctrine and your attitude toward doctrine determines whether you are blessed or disciplined in time check out Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 I have more to say about Hebrews chapter 11 uh, in a, uh, later but the issue in life is not sin fundamentalism makes uh, the issue in life sin and sin of course is a, is a reality but the the issue in life is whether Bible doctrine or evil are going to control your soul if doctrine controls your soul mark it down you are going to sin less and less as the Holy Spirit controls you and utilizes the doctrine that's in your soul but if evil controls your soul your old sin nature takes over and you become a servant of the devil you live in darkness you live as a part of the world system of darkness Bible doctrine must be more real to you than empirical knowledge let me share with you second Peter chapter 1 verses 12 to 21 where Peter says so I will always remind you of these things even that you even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have 
Uh, I know that to some people repetition is an abomination. They cannot stand it. As soon as they hear something, they assume they know. They shift into neutral, check out, and become uh, aggressively in their mind uh, antagonistic. But Peter says, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you know have. I think it is right to keep on refreshing your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon be putting it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. How do you do it? By putting it in writing, of course. Then he says this. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. That was at his baptism, remember. We ourselves heard this voice again uh, that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. This was the transfiguration. But we have, notice, but, we have the prophetic word made more certain. What, beloved, could be more certain than hearing the voice of God from heaven? I'll tell you what. It's the written word of God, the truth. We have the prophetic word made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That is, the, you meet the Lord Jesus personally. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture originated by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. If there ever is a conflict between what you see, what you observe, or what you experience in life, and what Bible doctrine says, Bible doctrine is always right. Bible doctrine is more real than anything else in all of life to the mature believer. As I started out saying earlier, Bible doctrine is reality. And what Bible doctrine says is absolute truth. Subpoint I, and I haven't been giving you these points, but they are in the outline, says this. Lack of Bible doctrine destroys a nation. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites. This was Hosea's prophecy to the northern kingdom. Hear the word of, of Yahweh, you Israelites. Because Yahweh has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. And then we have the charge, the condemnation from God to his people. There is no faithfulness to him, no love for him, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Which one, doctrine or evil? Evil won in the lives of these people, not doctrine. Verse 3 continues. Because of this, the land mourns divine discipline in the, cycles of, in the five cycles of discipline. And all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea are dying. But let no man bring a charge. Let no man accuse another. I mean, don't say it's, it's his fault or her fault. It's their fault. For your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. You stumble day and night, and the prophets stumble with you. That is, the people who, the, those who were teaching. If, if it were the church age, we would say your pastors are stumbling with you. Because they're why? They're not teaching the truth. So I will destroy your mother. That's your nation. Verse 6. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge of doctrine. 
because you have rejected knowledge of doctrine, I also reject you as my priests, my priest nation, my representatives, because you have ignored the Word of God, your God. I will also ignore your children. And I'm afraid that that's true of our nation. We do have a remnant in the nation. There are a large number of people, believe it or not, who love the Word of God, who love Bible doctrine, but I'm fearful. I'm fearful that that, that remnant of believers who love the truth is shrinking day in and day out. I have been looking for the remnant in this area, and I have been disappointed to note that there is not much interest in categorical Bible doctrine teaching in this area. However, you know, when God spoke to Isaiah and told him to be a prophet and to go and speak to Israel, <laughs> and uh, he, told, he, told them, he told Isaiah something that all of us who are pastors need to take to heart, even though it was said to a prophet. He said, go to a people who will not hear. <laughs> He told him in advance, nobody's going to listen to you. Go anyway. And Isaiah said, well, how long, how long do I keep on teaching the people who do not hear? And God said, till the cities are laid waste and desolate. And that's the same thing that we have uh, been given to us as pastors to, our, to communicate Bible doctrine. We do not communicate on the basis of those who listen. We do not communicate on the basis of those who respond. We communicate on the basis of the fact that thus saith the Lord. God said it. And what he says must be taught. If nobody listens, what he says must be taught. And as a result, we must be found faithful. Well, I'm going to pick it up at that time, in our, at that place in our next Bible class, and uh, I'll take it from there. Now,